na imbitahang resource persons but unfortunately the space is limited so I believe that they are properly seated sa basement as ah, a ground floor and uh, nanunood po sila ng ating uh, hearing sa ngayon so now we proceed with the acknowledging uh, former Senator Leila De Lima uh, for your opening statement please proceed good morning to the lead chair of the Quad Committee, Representative Barbers, to the other, the chairs of the other committees constituting the Quadcom, the members of the Quadcom, members of Congress, and also good morning to the other resource persons uh, at, um, invited for today's hearing. Actually, Paul, I have both a statement and a presentation. Medyo mahaba po, and I was advised right before the hearing that I should uh, cut it down. Although mahaba po talaga ang presentation ko. Best efforts, I will try to abbreviate. Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, before uh, our former senator uh, proceeds, can I just request that she puts the mic a little bit closer, oh. just so that we can hear her voice louder. Thank you very much. Okay. Salamat po. I attend this hearing with a deep sense of irony. I have not forgotten that in September and October of 2016, the House Committee on Justice conducted the inquiry on the Belibid drug trade. However, unlike this hearing, the real subject of that hearing was not really about the drug trade. The real subject of that 2016 House Committee hearing was all about destroying me for conducting a Senate inquiry which in so many aspects was like this one. The only difference between this hearing and that Senate hearing is that my committee inquiry was eight years earlier and Duterte was at the peak of power. Sa Senate hearing pong yun, ay kinun, kinun din ako yung drug war ni Duterte. At nagmakaawa pa po ako na tigilan na ito habang ilang daan pa lang ang mga nagiging biktima at huwag na sanang paabutin pa ng libo-libo. Ngunit sa kasawi ang palad, wala pong nakinig sa akin, lalo na may mga mayorya po tayo ng mga senador at congressman na ayon kay Senator Bongo noong isang araw, ay walang sawa sa pagpalakpak kay Pangulong Duterte sa bawat banggit niya sa pagsulong na madugong drug war sa kanyang mga sona. Sa halip ako ay pinaaresto, pinakulong, binusalan, ng halos pitong taon gamit ang mga gawagawang e ebidensya katulad ng testimonya ng mga ilang believe drug lords at inmates. I'd like to say that the objective for targeting me was thre threefold. To silence me, to destroy my credibility, and to serve as an example to others. By doing all three, my message to the people against Duterte's EJKs would no longer be heard or listened to, and no one else would dare to act as a messenger after seeing what was done to me. Since all three were achieved, the EJKs became accepted by public officials and the general population. This led to more killings because no one was arresting and prosecuting the killer cops and the vigilantes. This was impunity as never seen before in the Philippines outside of the bow. Sobrang nakakalungkot na Ngayon lamang nagkaroon ng napaka-komprehensibong pagtalakay ang Kamara de Representantes sa Drug War at mga EJK pagkatapos ng tumambak ang libo-libong bangkay na naging biktima ng drug war. Ayon nga po kay Professor Randy David, marahil ang pandinig na ito ng Kamara ay katumbas na rin na pang ng aming pinapangarap na Truth Commission na hihimay sa mga tunay na pangyayari sa anim na taon na pagpaslang ng ating sariling gobyerno at kapulisan sa libo-libo nating mga kababayan. But it, um, right now, I don't want to discuss it, but my position is that pwede pa sigurong i-consider yung creation ng Truth Commission. At tingnan din ho natin na hindi lang po pagpatay ang naging resulta ng War on Drugs ni Duterte. There are also those who were unjustly imprisoned based on planted and fabricated evidence. Ako nga po yung uh, one of the very first victims of that. Ngayon naman po, ito na rin po ang pinatutuo 
yung sa bagong revelasyon ni Police Colonel Royina Garma nang binulgar niya sa huling hearing ng Quadcom na siya ang inatasan mismo ni Pangulong Duterte na maghanap ng tao sa PNP na maasahan niya sa pag-iimplementa ng drug war alinsunod sa modelong ginawa niya sa Davao City. That's why my presentation, and I'd like to, I'll try to really make it brief, would cover four matters, four topics. One is the recent disclosure of Kerwin Espinosa. I'd like to comment on that. Two is the importance of the 2009 CHR investigation of the DDS to the inquiry of this, commission, of this uh, committee. Three is the revelation of former police colonel Rui Nagarma that the drug war was modeled after the Davao anti-drug campaign. And I'd like also to touch the relevance of Republic Act number 9851 on crimes against humanitarian law genocide and other crimes against humanity in enforcing accountability. So ito na po yung aking presentation, although meron po akong mga i-skip because actually part of my presentation are some videos, but hindi ko na po yon ipapakita because of the limited time. So nung narinig ko nga po yung uh, testimonia ni Kerwin Espinosa last hearing, I, uh, it was Senator Bato de la Rosa who ordered him to lie under oath before the Senate in November 2016. Hindi na po ako nagulat doon. Si Kerwin actually already rejected his fabricated testimony against me in April 2022, around the same time that Rafael Ragos, the former Bucor OIC and NBI Deputy Director, also recanted in accusing me of receiving money from Belibid drug lords. Dun po sa hearing sa Senado, ay talaga namang sinabi ko dun na lahat po ng mga sinasabi nila tungkol sa akin, so yung pagiging protector ko daw nung illegal drug trade ni Mr. Kerwin Espinosa ay wala ho yung katotohanan. I vehemently, categorically, and firmly went on record in denying those accusations. Sinabi ko rin nun, Na yung mga sinasabi nila, Kerwin Espinosa, ni Ronnie Dayan, and ni Colonel Espenido, ay wala talagang katotohanan. In the first place, hindi nga sila magkakilala. Nauna na nilang sinabi yun before they were presented before the Senate na hindi sila mga magkakilala. Dali lang po. So ngayon po, nandito si Colonel Espenido. I saw him earlier. If the Quad Committee would be so kind as to indulge me, gusto ko sana makiusap kay Colonel Espinido, sabihin niya na yung katotohanan. Kasi yung all he said during that Senate hearing was just, just to just let God be the witness to my innocence or something to that effect. Sana po ngayon, Colonel Espinido, sabihin niyo ran, na rin po ang katotohanan Kung pwede sabihin nyo na rin o i-corroborate nyo yung sinabi ni Kerwin na uh, si uh, then PNP Chief De La Rosa and now Senator De La Rosa ang involved or responsible for ordering the three of you to fabricate accusations against me. Now sinabi ko rin po kanina na I'd like to discuss the relevance of the CHR investigation and the Quadcom inquiry. Maybe at this point, I cannot yet do that. Sasabihin ko lang po na uh, mahalaga yung naging CS, uh, CHR investigation namin in 2009 into the DDS killings. Kasi pwede itong maging reference point in terms of painting a picture of the organization, the Davao uh, Death Squad, the operation, and the implementation of the drug of the Duterte drug war from the barangay to the national level. Kasi sinabi na nga ho ni Colonel uh, Garma, yung kanya mga revelasyon na the extrajudicial killings, yung mga operations under Duterte's drug war beginning in 2016 was just patterned after the drug mod, the uh, Davao model. And the Davao model can only refer or can only mean the DDS model or the Davao Death Squad. 
Skip muna po natin yan. Doon naman sa affidavit po ni Colonel Gadma, presented and expounded upon the last hearing, I'd like to share some information we got and some findings on the Davao model of payment and rewards mentioned by Colonel Garma. This, lim this information is limited to the facts uncovered during the 2009 CHR investigation on the Davao Death Squad. Next, next uh, slide, please. The history of the DDS can be divided into two. The period from 1988 to 1998 and the period from 2001 to 2016. So may break po. The break in these two periods coincides with then Mayor Rodrigo Duterte's hiatus as mayor of Davao City when he was elected congressman instead of mayor in 1998 due to the three-term limit. So for... Um, Brevity, I'll refer to the former mayor as MRRD. According to a witness in the 2009 CHR investigation, during the first period of the DDS from 1988 to 2000, the assassins were paid 15,000 for every victim. 5,000 goes to the uh, police handler and 10,000 to the assassins, who at the time consisted of rebel returnees aside from the active duty policemen who were their handlers. Their safe house was located inside the Nabalcom compound in Barangay San Pedro, Davao. After the summary execution of targeted victims, the DDS members regroup, would regroup at their safe house and divide the reward. During that time, MRRD sometimes personally gave out the kill orders and the reward money directly to the assassins themselves. Upon the return of MRRD as mayor of Davao in 2001, the DDS was upgraded into the Heinous Crimes Investigation Section, or HCIS, located at the Almendras Gym compound. The, the HCIS was an official unit of the DCPO, or the Davao City Police Office. The HCIS consists of both active duty PNP and civilian abanteros, abanteros or hit men. Most of the hit men are rebel returnees. They are supervised by PNP handlers. Each handler supervises three members. The task of the PNP handler is to give orders to his members as well as be responsible for their protection. According to the CHR witness, he was given a regular monthly salary of 5,000. During this time, the reward given to a team for every victim was anywhere from 13,000 to 15,000, 3,000 to 5,000 goes to the PNP handler, 7,000 to 8,000 was shared among the rebel returnees, and 500 to 1,000 to civilian informants. The HCIS civilian personnel or rebel returnees directly received salaries as auxiliary service workers. The funds for their salaries came from the office of the mayor. Functions have also been specialized, with members being designated to do either office support or field work. A team of one PNP handler and three civilian abanteros was given an average of three targets every month. May I now go also to the revelation of Arturo Lascanias. Yung mga naging findings mo namin, although yung iba po doon, mga unofficial findings ng CHR investigation, were eventually confirmed by Edgar Matobato and Arturo Lascanias when they went public at the Senate with their stories and executed affidavits in 2016 and 2017. Matobato executed an affidavit and was filed with the Ombudsman as a criminal complaint against Duterte and other DDS members. The criminal complaint is still pending, it's the office of the Ombudsman. The most comprehensive account on the DDS from its founding in 1988 up to 2016 is the affidavit of Arturo Lascanias, which was submitted to the ICC. This affidavit consists of 186 pages of gory details on the sociopathic behavior of Duterte as founder and leader of the DDS. 
Yung 186-page affidavit po yan, actually it was serialized in an investigative or feature story of Rappler in November 2021. Apparently, Rappler got, got hold of a copy of this affidavit and also the ICC's third agreement on limited use of information dated November 11, 2020. This instrument gave Las Cañas limited immunity as a witness in the ICC on this investigation on the Philippine War on Drugs. Nung 2024 naman po, Las Cañas reiterated the contents of his ICC affidavit in another serialized feature, this time published by Veria Files, entitled Conversations with Arturo Las Cañas. Ito naman po ang sinasabi ni Las Cañas, that during the period 1988 to 1998, so I'm just talking here about the organization, kasi napakadami po ng mga sinabi niya sa kanyang comprehensive affidavit. So I'm focusing on the organization of DDS dahil nga ito yung naging model ng uh, drug war. According to Lascania's ICC affidavit, during the period 1988 to 1998, when the DDS was constituted as the anti-crime task force of MRRD, DDS members were paid anywhere from 10,000 to 20,000 for every victim. This was the reward for the ordinary victims. Pag uh, mga matataas naman po, the so-called special project killings, they were re rewarded anywhere from 100,000 to 1 million pesos, depending on the status of the target. Civilian hitmen called force multipliers were given 3,000 to 5,000 per victim as their share in this reward. The DDS logistics and finances came from the Peace and Order or Intel Fund of MRRD. This includes weekly gas allowance, monthly cash allowance, and Christmas cash gifts. I, uh, I skip ko na muna po yung iba. Next uh, slide, please. Las Cañas also confirmed the CHR findings on the organizational structure of the DDS under the 8CIS, or Heinous Crimes Investigation Section, from 2001 to 2016. And this is as follows. MRRD, alias Superman, as the highest leader and mastermind of the DDS. SP04 Sanson Benaventura, as the logistics, finance, and death clearance feature or officer. SP03 Arturo Lascañas as overall team leader for operations and planning. SP04 Bienvenido Laud as team handler and in charge of the Laud Quarry Mass Grave. And SP03 Jim Tan as team handler and in charge of the Mandug Mass Grave. Actually, mas intricate yung prenis yung inattach ni uh, Mr. Lascania sa kanyang ICC affidavit about the organizational structure of the DDS. What I just mentioned, I just simplified it to show who are really at the top of the DDS hierarchy. Most of the policemen handlers and their respective teams of civilian force multipliers were under the command of Arturo Lascanias as operations and planning leader of the DDS. So sinabi ko po, now that must be the Davao model na binanggit ni Colonel Garma. Finally, by way of just sharing my, my knowledge, last, last na po ito, kung pwede po sana. Uh, what, tungkol na lang muna po sa the law RA 9851. Kasi hindi po ito masyadong alam ng karamihan. We do have a law entitled, An Act Defining and Penalizing Crimes yeah, Against International Humanitarian Law, Genocide and Other Crimes Against Humanity, Organizing, Jurisdiction, Designating Special Courts, and for Related Purposes. This was enacted in December 11, 2009. It punishes almost the same crimes mentioned in the Rome Statute, 
over which the ICC has jurisdiction. RA 9851 was enacted almost two years before the Philippines finally joined the ICC on November 1, 2011, after the Senate ratified the Rome Statute in August 2011. The crime of EJ case carried out by state security forces and their agents in the implementation of the war on drugs fall under the general category of other crimes against humanity under Section 6, which consists of acts committed as part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. These acts include willful killing, so murder, extermination, murder, multiple murder, torture, and enforced disappearance, among others. The penalty for the crime of systematic attack against any civilian population resulting in death is reclusion perpetua. It's a non-bailable crime. According to Section 8, a person who orders, solicits, or merely induces the systematic attack on the civilian population and which thereafter occurs or is attempted is liable as a principal. The same applies to anyone who contributes to the commission of the crime by a group of persons acting with a common purpose. Section 9 provides that official capacity as a head of state or government shall in no case exempt a person from criminal responsibility under this act, nor shall it in and of itself constitute a ground for reduction of sentence. The crimes defined and penalized under that law, their prosecution and the execution of sentences imposed on their account shall not be subject to any prescription. Pwede po silang tugusin or tugisin habang buhay. Finally, and this one is important, hindi po ito masyadong napapansin. Section 17 on jurisdiction provides that, quote, relevant Philippine authorities may dispense with the investigation or prosecution of a crime punishable under this act if another court or international tribunal is already conducting the investigation or undertaking the prosecution of such crime. Instead, the authorities may surrender or extradite suspected or accused persons in the Philippines to the appropriate international court, if any, or to another state pursuant to the applicable extradition laws and treaties. Napakasimple po, sa aking palagay, sa aking pagkaalam, napakasimple po ang ibig sabihin ng batas na ito. Hindi pa tayo miyembro ng ICC o ng Rome Statute. Kinala, kinilala na natin ang kapanyarihan ng international bodies like the ICC na imbestigahan at litisin ang mga krimeng nasasaad sa RA 9851. Hindi pa tayo miyembro ng ICC, meron na ho tayong general na pahintulot sa anumang mga international body katulad ng ICC na tugisin at litisin ang mga Pilipino na magiging kasabwat sa mga tinatawag na crimes against humanity katulad ng malawakang EJK sa ilalim ng drug war. Hindi pa tayo miyembro ng ICC na ilahad na natin sa batas na yan na kung sakali may international body na nag-iimbestiga ng crimes against humanity, maaari nating isurrender o i-extradite sa international body na katulad ng ICC sa The Hague, Netherlands, and mga sangkot sa mga ganitong klase ng krimen. I do recognize, and I think you will agree with me, that it will be totally discretionary on the part of the Philippine authorities. Just like si mga sa extradition po natin, na pwede natin na isurrender muna, ipaubaya muna in the requesting party yung isang akusado na cover sa extradition treaty pero nasa atin pa rin yun kung gagawin natin yun. Kaya ko po to sinasabi kasi through this law we have recognized the jurisdiction of the ICC over crimes against humanity committed in the Philippines even before we ratified the Rome Statute as a binding treaty. Sarili na po nating batas ang nagsasabi 
na kailangan natin makipag-ugnayan sa ICC kahit noong hindi pa tayo miyembro ng ICC. Lalo na noong tayo ay miyembro na. At kahit hindi na tayo miyembro ng ICC dahil sa makasariling pagkalas ni Duterte sa ICC noong 2018. Para sabihin natin na wala na tayong pakialam sa ICC, kailangan muna nating ipawalang bisa ang batas na ito. However, I respectfully submit Rather than repeal this law, we should now take steps to retract the self-serving act of Mr. Duterte to withdraw from the ICC in 2018. We must return to the fold of the ICC. We must rejoin the community of nations who have recognized the need for an international body of nations who have recognized to, to go after the perpetrators of the most terrible crimes against humanity, the hostis humani generis, the enemies of humankind. Mga kaaway lamang ng sangkatauhan ang takot sa pagsasani puwersa ng mga bansa upang matigil ng pagpatay ng walang habas sa ngalan ng Estado. But having said that, I still appreciate so much, many people appreciate so much, the efforts of this squad committee that can very well be indeed the Truth Commission. Kaya lang tindang ho natin, yung napaka-komplikado talaga ng usapa, usapin ng war of drugs. Kadaming biktima na hindi naman natin pwedeng busisiin lahat for every individual acts of killing. Kundi, dapat anuhin natin, maganda nga yung nangyayari doon sa mga revelasyon ni uh, Colonel Garma na ganyan yung ginamit nilang model. At tinuturo mismo si Mr. Duterte. So, ano lang siya? Supplemental, ano lang siya? Eh? It's just a, uh, corroborating everything else that we know from news reports, from other information, and from yung mga nangyayari beginning in 2016. So, I just shared my views on the, uh, on the need to rejoin ICC kasi you can never tell in the future ano man yung resulta ng ating, na itong ginagawang investigasyon ng Quad Committee na in the future we will have another tyrant, another mass killer for a president. So, ganun po ang aking opinion sa bagay na yan. Maraming maraming salamat Mr. po. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh,